It is noon on D-Day. Twelve hours have passed since the invasion began with the airborne assault. Twelve hours of constant action on and near the coast of Normandy. At noon, Winston Churchill gives a long address to the House of Commons, summing up the situation so far. I have also to announce to the House that during the night and the early hours of this morning, the first of the series of landings in force upon the European continent has taken place. In this case, the liberating assault fell upon the coast of France. An immense armada of upwards of 4,000 ships, together with several thousand smaller craft, crossed the channel. Massed airborne landings have been successfully effected behind the enemy lines, and landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points at the present time. The fire of the shore batteries has been largely quelled. The obstacles that were constructed in the sea have not proved so difficult as was apprehended. The Anglo-American allies are sustained by about 11,000 first-line aircraft, which can be drawn upon as may be needed for the purposes of this battle. I cannot, of course, commit myself to any particular details. Reports are coming in in rapid succession. So far, the commanders who are engaged report that everything is proceeding according to plan. And what a plan. This vast operation is undoubtedly the most complicated and difficult that has ever taken place. It involves tides, wind, waves, visibility, both from the air and the sea standpoint, and the combined employment of land, air, and sea forces in the highest degree of intimacy and in contact with conditions which could not and cannot be fully foreseen. There are already hopes that actual tactical surprise has been attained, and we hope to furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. The battle that has now begun will grow constantly in scale and in intensity for many weeks to come, and I shall not attempt to speculate upon its course. This I may say, however, complete unity prevails throughout the Allied armies. There is a brotherhood in arms between us and our friends of the United States. There is complete confidence in the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, and his lieutenants, and also in the commander of the Expeditionary Force, General Montgomery. The ardor and spirit of the troops, as I saw myself embarking in these last few days, was splendid to witness. Nothing that equipment, science, or forethought could do has been neglected, and the whole process of opening this great new front will be pursued with the utmost resolution both by the commanders and by the United States and British governments whom they serve. Later in the day, he will add more current information. I have been at the centers where the latest information is received, and I can state to the House that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. Many dangers and difficulties which at this time last night appeared extremely formidable are behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. The resistance of the batteries has been greatly weakened by the bombing of the Air Force, and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced their fire to dimensions which did not affect the problem. The landings of the troops on a broad front, both British and American, Allied troops, I will not give lists of all the different nationalities they represent, but the landings along the whole front have been effective, and our troops have penetrated, in some cases, several miles inland. Lodgements exist on a broad front. The outstanding feature has been the landings of the airborne troops, which were on a scale far larger than anything that has been seen so far in the world. These landings took place with extremely little loss and with great accuracy. Particular anxiety attached to them because the conditions of light prevailing in the very limited period of dawn, just before the dawn, the conditions of visibility made all the difference. Indeed, there might have been something happening at the last minute which would have prevented airborne troops from playing their part. A very great degree of risk had to be taken in respect of the weather. But General Eisenhower's courage is equal to all the necessary decisions that have to be taken in these extremely difficult and uncontrollable matters. The airborne troops are well established, and the landings and the follow-ups are all proceeding with much less loss, very much less than we expected. Fighting is in progress at various points. We captured various bridges which were of importance and which were not blown up. There is even fighting proceeding in the town of Khan, inland. But all this, although a very valuable first step, A vital and essential first step gives no indication of what may be the course of the battle in the next days and weeks, because the enemy will now probably endeavor to concentrate on this area, and in that event, heavy fighting will soon begin and will continue without end as we can push troops in and he can bring other troops up. It is, therefore, a most serious time that we enter upon, 
Thank God we enter upon it with our great allies all in good heart and all in good friendship. That's a fairly good summary of the general activity. Yeah, but it doesn't say much about the people actually living in France, though. You know, civilians, the resistance. I guess, though, the Churchill doesn't have a whole lot of information about what's going on with them today. But the British have had the SOE working in France, and they've sure been doing stuff leading up to today. But what about today itself? Well, there's a lot to talk about. After the terrible losses that the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, suffered at the hands of German forces in 1943... It looked as though the embryonic force of saboteurs, guerrillas, and resistance organizers would play very little of a role in D-Day. But we've seen SOE and its allies be extremely busy in the weeks and months leading up to today. But how did they manage to rebuild, and what sort of missions have they been carrying out? It's worth quickly running through the events of last year just to get an idea of the scale of the disaster. The... The collapse of the SOE networks in France and the French resistance cells they supported began last summer with the destruction of Prosper, a large network centered on Paris and spanning 12 French departements. When the Germans pulled apart Prosper, they also destroyed or severely damaged a whole series of interconnected circuits and sub-circuits. SOE's F section, that's F for France, lost 12 officers, this including Prosper's talented leader Francis Soutil. More pain came in the autumn with the near destruction of the circuit codenamed Scientists, centered on Bordeaux, stretching from Paris to the Pyrenees. André Grand Clément, a fiercely right-wing French army colonel and regional leader in the resistance group's OCM, the Organisation Civile et Militaire, turned traitor and helped the Germans round up perhaps one-third of Scientists' weapons and members. All in all, by the end of 1943, some 40 of F-Section's agents had been arrested. 10% of all the agents that F-Section will have sent into France over the course of the war. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. When Prosper and scientists were wiped out, thousands of French allies and helpers were also arrested, with many ending up in concentration camps. Now, SOE's circuits were not fully destroyed, though. But only 20 circuits remained at the turn of the year, many only surviving remnants of damaged circuits. Others, like the Donkey Man circuit, with its small groups from Normandy to Burgundy, had gone to ground to avoid enemy attention. Things were slightly better in the former unoccupied zone in the south. Men like Tony Brooks and his Toulouse-based network of railway saboteurs in Pimento continued to hold much more of a foothold there. To many observers, it looked like SOE's French operations might never properly recover. As 1944 comes around, the regular military leadership are all pretty much hostile to SOE and have little faith in the French resistance. In their view, SOE have little to show for three years of work. Emphasizing the doubters' fears, when Corsica was liberated in the autumn of 1943, the French resistance played little more than a supporting role. So why build on a foundation that's already failing? The British chief of the air staff, Charles Portal, and head of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris, are particularly opposed to divert precious RAF bombers from bombing German cities to dropping supplies and agents for SOE. But SOE and the Free French have an important ally, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the very one who originally ordered SOE to set Europe ablaze. Throughout January, resistance leaders and senior SOE officers make personal appeals to him. In February, the Prime Minister then orders the RAF to step up airdrops. It helps that by now, RAF also have a deepening cooperation with the United States Army Air Force and the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. I'll touch on that cooperation later. In any case... After poor weather held back many operations in February, things did pick up in March. By the end of that month, the RAF and USAAF have inserted 114 agents and another 260 follow from April to June. Total tonnage of stores flown in by the two air forces rises from just 139 between October and December 43 to 938 between January and March and almost 2,700 between April and June. By the time D-Day comes around, SOE has doubled its number of active circuits to around 40. 
One of those agents who parachutes into France in early 1944 is René Dumont Guillemet, who drops into Touraine on the night of February 5th. His task, rebuilding SOE's networks in Paris. After lying low for a time working for a network outside of Paris, he decides to see what he can salvage from the ruins of Prosper. In April, he establishes the spiritualist circuit and works hard to avoid the mistakes made by Prosper. He asks all new recruits to uphold security above all else and to leave behind the French political conflicts that have provided entry points for the Germans. Upon joining, they sign an oath. I pledge myself to reveal to no one that our organization exists. I swear I will hold myself night and day at the disposition of the Allied armies. I swear loyalty and obedience to the leaders I have freely chosen. I know any backsliding will be punished by death. Those who join the spiritualist would be foolish to take these words lightly. Dumont Guillemé means what he says, liquidating double agents as soon as he discovers them, and discovers them he does. He builds his forces quickly and soon has 1,500 fighters outfitted with arms and another 5,000 waiting for weapons to arrive. Another new network benefiting from the inflow of supplies is Minister. Set up in early March, it operates in the département of seine marne to the east and southeast of Paris. SOE send 60 containers in five parachute drops. The contents of these vary, but one of the standard 12 container loads is listed as follows. Nine rifles plus 150 rounds per gun. Eleven Sten submachine guns with 300 rounds per gun. Ninety-five empty Sten magazines and eleven loaders. 13,200 rounds of 9mm parabellum ammunition. 22,176 rounds of 303 ammunition. 140 empty magazines for Bren light machine guns. 660 field dressings. 145 pounds, 65 kilos of explosives. Now... Resistance and sabotage is expensive work, so cash and gold is just as important as lead. By the end of this year, SOE will have supplied almost 280 million francs to its agents in the field. Most of this is carried in with the officers themselves or dropped by parachute, but some of it is raised locally. Jean Savy is dropped into France on March 2nd, tasked with arranging financial and supply contacts with friendly business people. While at work, he stumbles on something even more important. He learns of a secret military facility in the caves of Saint-Leu-des-Serrans, near Cray, outside of Paris. Here, the Germans are assembling the first of their vengeance weapons, the V-1 flying bomb. Savy takes his intelligence back with him to London, and after flying some reconnaissance missions, the RAF will bomb the facility later this month. With... Manpower rebuilt, and with cash and weapons flowing in, there are some acts of industrial sabotage in Paris and its surroundings in the months leading up to D-Day. Some of these sabotage missions fit in with Allied war goals beyond preparing for D-Day. As Indy and I have discussed in our regular coverage of the war, the Allies have identified ball bearings as a potential bottleneck in the German war economy. The logic being that if you destroy the ball bearings factories, you slow the production of tanks, aircraft, artillery pieces, and all sorts of war machines. Now, that has largely been a miscalculation, with production not affected long enough to deplete stores and ball bearings in transit. But unlike the B-17 and B-24 bombers, SOE can target the factories with precision and create more lasting effects. Ball bearing factories in Auberville and Asnières sur Seine are attacked in April and May. In the aftermath, production is cut to levels between 20 and 30 percent. In Auberville, the effect is similar as the bomb runs. The drop lasts for just a few weeks. But in Anières, the workers are persuaded to work slowly in the aftermath, and the factory will never again restore its previous output. Still, the overall scale of industrial sabotage in Paris is limited. After the war, the official history of SOE will record just 10 major acts of industrial sabotage committed in and around the French capital in the six-month period between January 1944 and June 1944. But these numbers are an underestimate. They don't include cases of railway sabotage or cases where targets have been bombed after being identified by SOE. 
Neither do they include acts of sabotage carried out by the RF section. RF is the Gaulliste branch of SOE, which was separated from F section back in 1941 to avoid political bickering between the British and the non-Gaullists. Underestimated or not, industrial sabotage in Paris and northern France pales in comparison to the center and the south of the country. The largest circuit in the south is Stationer, which stretches from Châteauroux to Tarbes. Stationer is led by an RAF officer named Maurice Southgate, who is one of the few SOE leaders to have forged a relationship with the extreme left. He counts members of the communist Front Tireur et Partisans among his numbers, as well as many French veterans of the Spanish Civil War. Already, his forces have been hitting Germany logistics targets, and Southgate boasts that he and his men have rendered 300 locomotives unusable by New Year's Day of 1944. Stationer also goes for industrial targets. Again, many of these targets are linked to wider war goals such as destroying German fighter production capacity. Stationer commits one of its most powerful weapons to the task, a former French POW named Charles Reichenmann. Reichenmann is a Lorrainer, and as such, the Germans released him on racial grounds back in 1940. He swiftly repaid the favor by turning his back on his supposed Germanic allies and joined the SOE in 1942. Now he leads a sabotage team codenamed Rover, with operatives scattered through French industry. In March, he and his men set out to destroy the Hispano Suiza factory in Tab, which supplies aircraft engine components to the Luftwaffe. The first attack on March 29th is a failure. The plastic explosives destroy two transformers, but this has almost no effect. So the team tries again on April 13th. This time, they destroy the casting molds used for making engine cylinder heads and succeed in shutting the plant down for five months. Some of SOE's most effective missions are when they have the factory owners on their side. Since the German occupation, Peugeot has swapped the manufacturing of cars for tank turrets and vehicle engines for fighter engines. The RAF bombed Peugeot's manufacturing plant in Sochaux near the Swiss border back in July 1943, but succeeded only in killing hundreds of locals. Fortunately, Henri Ré and his stockbroker circuit discovered that the Peugeot family are sympathetic to the Allies. After some negotiations, the family agreed to assist in sabotaging their own factory. The first attack went off in November 43. After playing a friendly game of football with the German guards, the saboteurs planted their explosives and destroyed the power station and the assembly hall full of tank components. That puts tank production out of action until February this year, at which point Re and his men launch a follow-up attack which knocks out tank production for the remainder of the war. After that, in March, they crippled the production of aero engines, bringing output down to just 40% for the remainder of the war. For factory owners who are uncooperative, SOE can summon swift retribution. Pearl Witherington commands a section of stationer and contacts the management of the Michelin tire factory in Clermont-Ferrand. She tells Michelin that they can either agree to surgical SOE sabotage, which will allow the factory to resume working after liberation, or the RAF can flatten the complex. Michelin refused the deal, believing that the RAF are too busy to strike their complex. On March 11th, Witherington contacts London and recommends that the RAF give the management a lesson. The bombers of RAF 617th Squadron deliver an impressively precise strike, destroying the workshops but leaving the workers' canteens standing. French casualties are relatively light at just 36. SOE's attacks certainly aren't limited to military industry alone, though. SOE also hits French power generation very hard, with at least 15 F-section attacks in the first half of the year. These range from high-altitude attacks on hydroelectric plants in the Alps and the Pyrenees to attacks on the coal mining commune of Decazeville in Occitan. Altogether, SOE's F-section records 67 acts of industrial sabotage across France in the six months from January to June 1944. This is almost one and a half times as many attacks as the whole of 1943. 
Alongside this, SOE and the resistance have also been assaulting the French railway system in coordination with the Allied bombing campaign, the transport plan. They've destroyed or damaged 1,600 locomotives and have put 70,000 goods wagons out of action, as well as hitting bridges, marshalling yards, and locomotive production and repair facilities. Last night alone, they made 950 cuts to the rail system in preparation for today's landings. Of course, not all F-section's industrial attacks are successful. In some cases, explosives fail or are planted in the wrong place. Security forces and staff members also interfere with SOE's plans. Other times, the sabotage plans are poorly planned. In the aftermath of a failed attack on an aero engine plant in Lyon, the plant engineer comments that SOE could have done more damage by leaving the plastic explosives at home and simply smashing the engines with hammers. Finally, beyond sabotage, there is also the building up of secret armies ready to rise when the liberation begins. Much of the manpower comes from the Maquis, young men who have fled from the Vichy Forced Labor Program, the Service du Travail Obligatoire, or STO, and organize themselves into small guerrilla armies. Earlier today, I talked about the Maquis of the Vercourt Plateau, who are currently fortifying their rocky fortress and preparing to declare a new French Republic. There are now some 50,000 of these fighters scattered across France, mainly in the Alps and southern France, but also in Brittany. When Churchill learns about them in January 1944, he becomes somewhat obsessed. He believes that with the right support, the Maquis can rise up and turn the southeast of France into a new Yugoslavia. Stretching German forces in such a way would relieve pressure on the Allied advance in Normandy after D-Day and smooth the way for an invasion of the south of France. The Maquis have actually had priority of supply over the past six months, and the missions to support them demonstrate a new level of cooperation between the British SOE and American OSS. Relations between the two services have improved a great deal over the past year, and their missions in France are now jointly coordinated under the Special Forces Headquarters, or SFHQ. The USAAF contributes some of its heavy bombers to supplying the Maquis. Some of these drops have been more successful than others, though. Some have been tragically successful for the Germans, like in February, when 220 containers dropped through cloudy weather in the Haute-Savoie end up gifting the enemy a lot of new weaponry. But supplies do get through, and the Maquis have made life very difficult for the German occupiers in the south. Trains and railways are blown up, convoys ambushed, and German soldiers and security forces are assassinated. Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt will later claim that the situation is so bad that from January 1944, all commanders reported a general revolt. Cases became numerous where whole formations of troops and escorting troops of the military commanders were surrounded by bands for many days and in isolated locations simply killed off. The life of the German troops in southern France was seriously menaced and became a doubtful proposition. Of course, we have to take Rundstedt's words with a healthy pinch of salt. The truth is that despite SOE's and OSS's efforts, the Maquis remain lightly armed and have only minimal training. An estimate in April concludes that most Maquis have enough arms and ammunition for only a few days of heavy fighting. The Maquis do excel at hit-and-run tactics, sabotage, and irregular warfare, but they cannot match the Wehrmacht in open combat. Hence, why the Maquis on the Vercourt Plateau have pinned their hopes on Allied paratroop support. But... Framing the Maquis in such existential terms is a German justification for harsh anti-partisan operations launched in the south of France. Operations which, just as on the Eastern Front and in Yugoslavia, hit innocent civilians hardest. The Maquis also form an important part of the next stage of the Special Operations War. Beyond Simply harassing the enemy, the SFHQ has tasked SOE and OSS with building the Maquis into a force that can seize territory, guard liberated areas, and provide internal security. To this end, several inter-allied missions composed of British, American, and French officers have been training groups of Maquis, including those en Vercourt, for the past few months. 
The next phase of inter-allied cooperation with the resistance began late yesterday evening, June 5th, when a three-man team parachuted into central France near Châteauroux. They are the first of the Jedburg teams, special forces men drawn from British, American, French, Belgian, and Dutch armies. Each three-man team includes two officers, usually lieutenants or captains, and a radio operator, usually a sergeant. The radio operator is perhaps the most important of the three. He is to use his Type B Mark II or Jed set to keep London in the loop. Unlike the men and women of SOE, the Jeds have been sent into France in military uniforms in the hopes that this will offer them some protection against torture, execution, or other maltreatment in the event of capture. Their job is to liaise with the resistance forces behind the German lines. Although their tasks are quite similar to that of the previous SOE and OSS agents, the Jedburg teams are more explicitly military in nature. Their job is not to take over the leadership of resistance groups, but to coordinate and synchronize resistance activities with regular Allied military operations. The Jeds carry with them weapons and explosives and are to give instructions on their use to the resistance. Their plan is that they will then assist the resistance groups in destroying rail lines and bridges, sabotaging telecommunications and power lines in order to harass and delay the movement of German reinforcements towards the Normandy beachhead. Over 100 Jedburgh teams are waiting in Britain to be sent into action. The Jedburgh teams usher in the next stage of the Special Operations War in France. But how can we evaluate this war effort so far? Well, it's hard to reach a conclusion yet. We'll have to wait and see what SOE, OSS, and the Jedburgh teams and the French resistance have in store in the coming weeks and months. Before today, SOE's industrial sabotage never reached the scale where it seriously degraded the German war production capacity. However, although it is hard to quantify such things, pound for pound, there is no doubt that SOE are more effective than the heavy bombers of the RAF and the USAAF. By the end of the war, SOE in France will have expended just 3,000 pounds or about 1,400 kilos of explosives in carrying out its major sabotage missions. That is less than the bomb load of a single mosquito bomber. On top of that, Bomber Command regularly loses more men in a single night than the 200 F-Section agents who will be arrested by the end of the war. Significantly, when measured operation by operation, their attacks have more effect and longer lasting effect. And we haven't yet seen the full scope of SOE's sabotage work against the railways and the organization of guerrilla armies now purporting to harass German troops while Operation Overlord proceeds. In the days, weeks, and months after D-Day, as the Allies hope to advance through Normandy and beyond, these groups are expected to interdict German forces and prevent them from moving to the front. Their success, or otherwise, in this will be the real measure of the merit of special operations. It would be nice if we could actually have boots on the ground in France and, 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 and talk to someone who's there. We can. Yeah, I know, but I, I, wanted, to give, I wanted to give a little lead in. Okay, I'll tell you what, you want to do the honors? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw in the first episode that we have several other hosts today, though you haven't seen them yet, but one of them is our friend and own location expert, Paul Woodage. Paul is a real world-class expert about this stuff. He also runs the channel World War II TV, which you should all check out. Anyhow, Sparty, in your War Against Humanity series, you talk a lot about resistance organizations. Let's hear what you and Paul have to say about the French this day. In our War Against Humanity series, the Sparty series, uh, we cover all the various resistance movements throughout the war. And, of course, the French resistance is no episode. And, uh, obviously, they had roles to play today. Can you give some deeper insight into the French resistance role in the affairs of this day that I might not have got into so deeply in the regular? Yeah, sure. Well, what well, the resistance isn't here in Normandy is going out, blowing up trains and, you know, doing that active kind of surly men with berets and stubble and sten guns. That's happening elsewhere in France. What's happening here, it's all about intelligence gathering. It's about force maximizing for the Allies to get that extra information about where they're going to be landing. So 
you know, you have these units here, the Century Network out of Koi, it's, very, it's just a few dozen people, but they're monitoring which units are arriving, insignia changes, they're getting access to offices to get plans of the Todd workers, the construction of bunkers, thicknesses of bunkers, all that kind of information there, so, so being sent back to the, to the, the Allies to prepare for D-Day, and the case in point being all the information about the bridge here oh, yeah. was provided by the resistance, so Major Howard had a clear idea of here's the customs office, here's the checkpoint, here's the barrier, here's the pub, here's the Germans did this, and it, all there by the French. And, and we had two people that were involved with that intelligence gathering that were, that were in the middle of the action as well, Mr. Gondry who owns the cafe yeah, behind yeah, us, yeah. and the matron of the maternity ward behind us. I mean, it was a, a pretty intense day for them. It absolutely was, yeah, and, and overlooked a little bit in the grand scheme of things is what these people are doing, and it was a coincidence, really, that the Gondre Café that we're sitting in front of was, was one of the areas where one of these few members of resistance, resistance actually was working, but it, it, it all benefited the Allies. We need the location. There's a guy living there who has all the information we need, so it couldn't have worked out better. But I want to ask you, you know, why, what's happening with the resistance at a kind of a higher level, you know, with the Churchill and SOE and OSS? It's a, because resistance is, can be many different things. So what was happening at that level? Well, I mean, the thing is that this really goes back to the beginning of French resistance. Uh, and it had one problem that many of the resistance movements had that was very difficult to resolve here, and that was the ideological divisions within it. So we had five major resistance movements that could not agree on what it was. But there was a higher level of issues that really impacted the role of the resistance on D-Day. Um, and that was the conflict between Churchill, Roosevelt, and de Gaulle. Yeah. Now, Churchill was sort of in the middle on this, but um, Roosevelt was very worried about de Gaulle uh, coming in and installing a government inside of France that would not have been democratically elected. Churchill was less worried about it, but, and de Gaulle was absolutely furious for Roosevelt for not letting him do that. Not so, even meeting him. Not even mm. meeting him. They, they were, I mean, they, they were really, really at odds with each other. Um, so when they were planning this, there were a lot of discussions back and forth about what are we gonna let them do for the invasion day and for the campaign that happens after it. And the resistance was really champing at the bit to get in the fight, to, to do exactly what you said, to, to get out there and start blowing things up, uh, take their Sten guns out and their Thompson guns and whatever, and just, you know, shoot some Germans. That was, the, that was what they wanted to do. Churchill and Roosevelt said, no, not under any circumstances. The other thing they wanted to do was to do what, what de Gaulle said, install the government. Churchill and Roosevelt said, no, no way, not going to happen. We're going to, like, occupy France, and then you can have elections, and then you can go on and do it. So what ended up happening was, however, that all of that became kind of moot, because in 43, the resistance was obliterated by the Gestapo, yeah. partly because of incompetence on the British side. You've seen this in, in my episodes a lot about it. Um, and that impacted the day. But they still needed what the resistance wanted to do, which was to blow up trains and do all of that. So basically what they did was to create a big zone where uh, Churchill and Roosevelt said, okay, within this zone, we want no active resistance. Outside of that, they can start blowing up trains. So they blew up like over a hundred, I think it's 130 or so. You, you'll have seen in the episodes exact how many, but they blew up a lot of, of train tracks. And that was really important in supporting the whole thing because there, through that, the Germans couldn't get here. But what's really interesting is that de Gaulle played a trick on them. And the trick that he pulled on them, that is that he went ahead and did what they had said that he couldn't do anyway. And again, as you will see in the episodes later on today, um, the government part of it was already there. So when uh, around noon, when things are starting to calm down a little bit, the resistance goes into action and starts taking over Normandy and starts administrating all of the rescue efforts, uh, governmental issues in general, identifying collaborators, all of those things are actually happening by the resistance. So this conflict that had been going on between the leaders was really taken straight into this day. Mm. And, and, and it, it, you know, possibly, if, if not possibly, definitely it was a tragedy because, and this is the really sad bit about it, because they had decided to not allow the resistance to do any sabotage action, the only option left was carpet bombing. And this killed thousands and thousands of French people. And 
that was the effect of it. At the end of the day, it was the French people who paid for this conflict between these three leaders with their lives. Yeah. Wow. That's something you don't think about often enough, how the power plays of a few people really can affect the life or death of thousands far away. But here today, there's even more of it. I mentioned earlier today that the Germans had been very successful in capturing SOE agents and French resistance operatives through something called the Radiospiel, or radio game. This was the brainchild of Paris Sicherheitsdienst head Hans-Josef Kiefer. Over the past couple of years, Kiefer and his men have induced captured SOE agents into transmitting back to London as if all is well. These captive agents request more agents, weapons and cash to be flown in from the UK, agents and weapons which the Gestapo promptly capture upon landing. The agents held by the Gestapo have tried everything in the arsenal and protocols to insert warnings to the SOE, but these warnings have been repeatedly ignored, while wishful thinking, incompetence and politicking has dominated SOE's handling of their agents inserted straight into enemy hands. But now the Gestapo decide to bring the game to an end, and at about midday, the last message is sent to London from the Gestapo's Parisian headquarters at 84 Avenue Foch. I mentioned earlier today that the Germans had been very successful in capturing SOE agents and French resistance operatives through something called the Radiospiel, or radio game. This was the brainchild of Paris Sicherheitsdienst head Hans-Josef Kiefer. Over the past couple of years, Kiefer and his men have induced captured SOE agents to transmit back to London as if all is well. These captive agents request more agents, weapons, and cash to be flown in from the UK. Agents and weapons which the Gestapo promptly capture upon landing. The agents held by the Gestapo have tried everything in the arsenal and protocols to insert warnings to the SOE, but these warnings have been repeatedly ignored, while wishful thinking, incompetence, and politicking has dominated SOE's handling of their agents inserted straight into enemy hands. But now, the Gestapo decides to bring the game to an end, and at about midday, the last message is sent to London from the Gestapo's Parisian headquarters at 84 Avenue Foch. You might be wondering why the Germans would bring such a successful counter-espionage operation to a close. Surely, controlling a significant chunk of the Allied underground subversion force would be really useful now that France has been invaded. That's certainly true, but the Germans have decided to exchange this long-term advantage for short-term gain. They believe that revealing the extent of their victory here will unnerve Schaeff and throw the Allies off balance. The ensuing panic might just open up some sort of window of opportunity. It's a vague and desperate hope, but that's what they have decided to do. In any case, the message reads, Many thanks. Large deliveries, arms, and ammunition sent. During long period all over France, stop. Have greatly appreciated good tips concerning your intentions and plans, stop. We had to take under the care of Gestapo your friends of French section such as Max, Fono, Theodore, etc., etc., stop. It's a boastful message. Those names, Max, Fono, Theodore, they're SOE code names. The Gestapo are twisting the knife over SOE's losses. But the truth is, the whole thing has provided almost zero benefit to facing off the Allied invasion. Despite this, the Gestapo try and spark some panic in London. Very pleased to have your visit, for which we have prepared everything. Again, this is clearly nonsense. If the Germans had been fully prepared for D-Day, Rommel wouldn't have been back in Germany at the moment of invasion, German forces wouldn't be waiting in Calais for a non-existent landing, and Hitler wouldn't have been asleep. The message has nothing close to the Germans' desired effect. As of May, the SOE had finally accepted that their agents were compromised. This belated realization is nothing to be proud of given the repeated warnings over the past two years. Nonetheless, SOE's response is almost as smug as the Gestapo's. It reads, Sorry to see your patience is exhausted and your nerves not so good as ours. Stop. Sorry, we gave you so much trouble in collecting containers, but we had to carry on until our officers had been able to make bigger and better friends. Expense and stores, no object. Stop. To 
try and frame the whole thing as part of some sort of master plan is desperate, to say the least. To write off as no object the cost in lives, money, and material is laughable. More than that, it's an insult to the SOE agents and radio operators, the RAF pilots, and the French civilians who have taken on the highest of risks. SOE may like to pretend that they have won the spy war in France, but it's a Pyrrhic victory, to say the least. If you've been watching Astrid's Spies and Ties series, you'll know that some SOEs, brightest and most promising agents, have been thrown in prison or transferred to concentration camps as a direct result of London's failures. Few of them will survive to see the end of the war. That's really sad. And and there was no master plan there. There's so much behind the scenes going on today, so much with civilians and with the intelligence war. And later on today, we'll go in great depth into the deception games and the spies, the actual overall intelligence master plan, things the general public has no idea about. And what does the general public know at this point? What's happening in the news story? How is it developing? That's actually very interesting right now. The news by the Allied broadcasters this hour is dominated, of course, by the details given in Churchill's speech to the House of Commons. The snippets released to the press provide the first details of today's operations with numbers, the message that the landings have held and the invasion looks to be a success. The press briefing the Germans prepared last hour, though, goes off at the top of this hour. The reporting that follows contains geographic details details that the Western allies have not released. Most significantly, it stands in stark contrast to Churchill's speech as it predicts failure for the United Nations and, as planned, frames it as Bolshevik orchestration. U.S. radio is quick to pick up on the German broadcasts. The news by the Allied broadcasters this hour is dominated by the details given in Churchill's speech to the House of Commons. The snippets released to the press provide the first details of today's operation with numbers. The message that the landings have held and the invasion looks to be a success. The press briefing that the Germans prepared last hour goes off at the top of this hour. The reporting that follows contains geographical details that the Western Allies have not released. Most significantly, it stands in stark contrast to Churchill's speech as it predicts failure for the United Nations and, as planned, frames it as a Bolshevik orchestration. U.S. radio is quick to pick up on the German broadcasts. Columbia shortwave listening station reports that Radio Berlin's first propaganda comment on the invasion was a flat statement that the invasion was undertaken because the orders of Moscow could not be evaded any longer. Our Columbia shortwave listening station recalls that for several months now, the Berlin propagandists have been trying to persuade their enemy audiences that the Allies would be forced to invade Europe because Joseph Stalin demanded an invasion. There's not much sign that anyone took them very seriously, not even in the countries which are friendly to Germany. Other Berlin propaganda so far this morning is just about what you'd expect. German broadcasters are talking about air defenses clicking into action and about German forces launching effective attacks against Allied formations. However, as you may have heard if you've been with us during this night-long broadcast, Allied correspondents who flew over the scene reported few signs of German resistance So perhaps we can chalk that up as just another German effort to frighten us. While the invasion today is by no means orchestrated by the Soviets, it is a concerted effort by the United Nations Alliance. And as you've seen with us, Neptune launching Overlord is the first step in the pincer movement that will be in complete motion when Bagration starts in the east. While this is not public information, now that the news is that the invasion looks successful, the U.S. broadcasters begin speculating about a possible offensive on the Eastern Front. We've had no word uh, from Russia so far, incidentally. You never know, we might get some word. The Russian offensive, we've all understood, was to be coordinated with the beginning of the Allied uh, invasion of Europe. Of course, coordination does not necessarily mean that the an offensive on the Eastern Front would begin at the exact, de- the exact time and day that the invasion of the West across the Channel would begin. But everyone does expect that some sort of offensive on the Eastern Front and probably a gigantic offensive will be coordinated with the invasion across the Channel. On the Eastern Front, land action is still on a relatively quiet scale. But the Russians are expected to strike out now to renew their drive toward the West, toward Berlin. There's been every sign of late that the Red Army was holding its divisions back 
waiting for the opening of the Second Front in Europe. With that Second Front now opened, new large-scale offensive action is expected from the Russians. The latest word we have from Moscow, though, gives no indication that such a renewed offense has yet begun. The Germans continue to attack around the Romanian city of Iasi, and the Russians continue to beat them back, taking a heavy toll of enemy soldiers and equipment. The broadcasters also note that, as far as they know, there has been no reports to the Japanese people or any official reaction by the Japanese government to the news of the day. On the other hand, despite that the news broke in the middle of the night in the U.S., CBS reports on the first reactions by the American people. The morning is very bright now in New York. It's only 17 minutes past 6 in New York, Eastern War Time. But the morning does seem to be well advanced. The sun is high in the sky. And uh, while speaking about New York's waking up, you will probably want to know how New York's famous Times Square reacted to the news that the invasion has at last begun, the news which came in in the middle of last night and uh, which we have been broadcasting constantly since it did come in. The news of the invasion was received with calm in Times Square. There were relatively few people, mostly a few servicemen, on the streets at that early hour. Here and there, groups of servicemen and civilians collected around taxi cabs and listened to radio reports of the landings on the coast of France. There were no demonstrations at all. About 25 persons gathered in front of a newsreel theater on Broadway at 4 o'clock in the morning when a radio loudspeaker blared forth the latest bulletins. And for all we know, perhaps that loudspeaker is blaring forth my voice at this moment. In other parts of the city, householders were up and at their radios. We could see scattered lights in apartment houses from out of the Columbia windows here in our news headquarters and uh, watchers, I might say, along Upper Broadway reported that scattered lights were seen all over town. At the Bendix Aviation Corporation Marine Division plant in Brooklyn, 500 swing shift workers gave a spontaneous cheer when the news was received, but the management said the workers remained at their jobs and not a second was lost. A scene that was probably typical of that in many public places here in New York was enacted at an east side restaurant where about 20 diners rose and listened with bowed heads as the first reports were broadcast on a radio in the restaurant. Mayor F.H. LaGuardia of New York was told of the invasion by police, and he called upon the people of the city to carry on at their jobs to give the men in the invasion forces their utmost support. Mayor LaGuardia announced plans for a mass prayer meeting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern War Time in Madison Square, where the eternal light, a memorial for the soldiers of the First World War, is burning. Uh, that's uh, the way New York took the news of the invasion. That's the way New York has taken it up to this moment. At about 21 minutes past 6 o'clock in the morning, New York time, there'll be further reports of how New York received the news as the city wakes up, and there will undoubtedly be further reports, which we shall give you from other cities and places in the country, telling us how the rest of the United States received the news that at last the liberation of the continent of Europe has started. I'd say it's very much more than started. I'd say it's started and heavily contested. Well, things at the British beaches, at the beaches themselves, have quieted down a bit lately, but not at the American ones, and certainly not at the bridges where victory or defeat is still very much up in the air. By about midday, most of 7th Battalion has reported in for duty at the bridges, arriving singly or in small groups. Enough have arrived, actually, that Pine Coffin releases Howard's platoons from duty. Howard brings them to the area between the bridges. Enemy snipers remain active, however, and the moaning minis come in every once in a while. 7th Battalion's D Company returns fire on the snipers, but as one man confesses, we couldn't see them, we were just guessing. But the action around here has been heating up. The Germans are starting to bring in tanks. The first one around the corner, though, is blown up by a gammon bomb since the Piat is out of action. Fortunately for the defenders here, it blocks the road. Nigel Taylor has been wounded in the thigh and is directing his end of the battle from a second story window. Richard Sweeney Todd comments on that. We could hear Nigel's voice encouraging the chaps, leg practically blown off and lying up in the window of a house encouraging the chaps. But they do need encouragement. They don't have any radios. They don't have any field telephones. The battalion sent over, yeah, that was great. But Taylor's force is down to around 30 or so men, and a lot of them are wounded. 
There had as yet been no determined German armored attacks. Von Luck was still waiting for orders in his assembly area, which was fortunate for the paratroopers as they had only Piats and Gammon bombs with which to fight tanks. But panzers could be expected at any time, coming down from Cannes into Benouville or up from the coast into Le Port. Over on the other side of the river, by noon, the mining work by 591 Royal Engineers is finished. Enough anti-personnel mines have been collected to lay an anti-personnel minefield between Le Bas de Ranville and the River Orne, but not enough to complete a second. They've also made a start on an anti-tank minefield through the orchards between Le Marquet and Erouvillette, but there are only enough mines to do the southern half of the belt and even that at half the normal density. So the northern half has been laid as a dummy minefield since they do have enough fencing wire and minefield marking materials for that. The mines, in case you wondered, were dropped in containers from the parachute planes. And so were basically as scattered as everything and everyone else was, though many of them fortunately came down in Ranville itself. By now, there are scattered small attacks against 13th Battalion around Granville, but all of these have been beaten off so far, and several enemy self-propelled guns have been destroyed. With the German strongpoint west of the Saint Laurent draw being neutralized, the battle is clearly shifting in that sector. The 16th Infantry is now pushing inland and towards colleville sur mer A new assembly area for the 1st and 2nd Battalions is drawn up, now more than a thousand meters inland. And while they climb the bluffs, engineers and demolition experts of the 1st Division prepare to open up the Saint Laurent exit for vehicular transport. Despite the constant mortar shelling, the bulldozers are pushing forward, pushing mines, wire, and obstacles aside. The 16th Infantry are now finally able to challenge the enemy for the possession of Colville and Le Grand Hameau. Like Virville, both Colville and Le Grand Hameau are rather unremarkable Norman villages that would not have made more than a footnote in history if it was not for the battle unfolding around them. But this battle, will be very different from at Verville, which they just walked into. At Colville, the 16th is immediately under German defensive fire, and every step forward is strongly contested. Unknown to them, the Germans have brought in what the Allied fear the most, reserves. The 2nd Battalion of the 915th Grenadier Regiment has come down from Bayeux and dug in here. Well equipped and ready to fight, the Germans are not gonna be pushed out here for the rest of the day. At the Cabourg Draw, at the far east of Omaha Beach, the 3rd Battalion is now also finally breaking through the gaps in force. Beyond it, the spearhead of Company L begins to follow a narrow dirt road westward, which leads to a fork in the road. To the west is the hamlet Cabourg, to the east, Le Grand Amo. Company L sits tight at the fork and sends out a scouting patrol to each of the villages. The three-man Cabourg patrol vanishes almost immediately. Looking into the future, nothing will be heard from them until tomorrow when they manage to return with 50 enemy prisoners. The four-man patrol sent towards Le Grand Amo returns much sooner, like right away, bringing with them the valuable intelligence that the village is occupied by a strong enemy force, a strong enemy force that is now on its way towards them. So with their backs to the draw, Company L soon makes a desperate stand against a strong German counterattack. No one wants to be pushed back onto that cursed beach. And the fighting here only grows in intensity over the next couple hours. Over in the west, with the enemy being driven back, they can now flatten the road surface, fill anti-tank ditches, and clear exit road E1. Even the Navy gets engaged here. A heavy barrage by battleship Texas, backed by destroyers McCook and Thompson hits the German positions covering the Virville draw. This levels houses, destroys guns, and even partially collapses the seawall. From under four kilometers offshore, this is basically point blank range for the ships and leads to many stunned Germans having enough and surrendering. With the shelling now hitting the German positions near the draw, General Coda disengages himself from the fighting near Virville village. So far there, the men of the 116th and the Rangers are keeping the German attackers at bay. Coda, though, is increasingly worried about the draw itself, which is still closed. If they really want to throw the Germans back and widen their perimeter, 
They need the support of heavy weapons and tanks, and for that, it needs to be open. So, with a couple of soldiers and engineers in tow, he wants to personally see why the damn draw hasn't been opened, or at least been wired with explosives by now. The plain and simple answer he gets is that the German defensive fire has prevented that. So, in a total reversal of the basic Omaha plan, Coda now decides the draw must be secured not from the sea, but from the landward side. Under repeated attacks, the center of an anti-tank wall finally begins to crack. Soon it is wide enough for the men to come through one by one, and the battered Germans are soon also surrendering at the caverns east of the draw and coming down the bluffs. It looks like it won't be long until it is in American hands. On his command ship, General Collins receives the good news that causeways one and three have been successfully secured and that they have made contact with the airborne. Although the assault at Utah Beach has strayed from its original plan, the whole operation has gone much smoother than expected. The first waves landed in an area that turned out to be far more approachable and less defended and fortified than the original beach. And the terrain itself did not favor the defender as it did at, say, Omaha. There were a couple pillboxes and larger bunkers that survived the preliminary bombings, okay, but they did not dominate the high ground and could only observe a relatively short distance in front of them. Overwhelming numbers and an aggressive push by highly motivated men quickly decided matters on the coast here. What now remains is to solve the whole traffic jam problem and help the advancing columns establish themselves inland. If the rest of the invasion has gone according to plan, then thousands of paratroopers were swarming over northern France already at the time the seaborne assault here began. In that case, all Colonel Van Fleet's 8th Infantry has to do is go out there and say hi. Every German caught between the two forces would be crushed between the hammer and the anvil. But you know, while capturing causeways 1 and 3 is certainly good news, to achieve total victory, 7th Corps has to secure the others as well. And situated in between 1 and 3, causeway 2 presents the central road leading off the beaches. At its end, some 5 kilometers from the coast, stands Saint-Marie-du-Mont, which also guards an important road juncture that provides the quickest way inland. If the enemy still holds firm at causeway 2 and Saint-Marie-du-Mont, that might delay the whole advance and prevent the Americans from linking up their forces. They expect at least several hundred German soldiers to be present in the area. But where exactly is anybody's guess? Now, sure, the German defenders have been generally overwhelmed here, and sure, for a variety of reasons, but one I have not mentioned so far is that Hans Wilhelm von Schlieben, commander of the 709th Division, as you may remember, has not been here. Yep. I mean, he's not been in Germany like Rommel or anything, but he is not in Cotentin. He has been in Rennes to the southwest for a war game. He was awakened at 5.30 this morning and told the war games were canceled and he should return to his division. His headquarters are, in fact, at a chateau north of Valogne, and he doesn't arrive until past noon. When he does, he is told that his fellow general, Wilhelm Falli, is dead. The Regiment de la Chaudière has been waiting south of Bernier for a couple of hours for the order to advance, and in fact, end up waiting there until afternoon before they begin the attack towards Beny sur mer with support from the armor of the Fort Gary Horse. They take it mid-afternoon. This is the first of 8th Brigade's objectives. They then move on to Basli and Colombie sur Town. The SGB bridge over the AVRE in the crater has been used to get traffic off Mike Beach for three hours now, but since there's no more enemy resistance here, it's filled with rubble to make a permanent crossing. The tank is still entombed under the road, just making a totally wild guess here. I bet it stays there until the 1970s when Royal Engineers dig it out and restore it. I bet. Back to the first Suffolks. We saw B Company take the Morris strong point, but A and C Companies are hard at work on a very formidable enemy position, the Hillman strong point, 
WN-17. This is the headquarters of Oberst Ludwig Krug's 736 Infantry Regiment. It's 600 by 400 meters in size, with not one, but two H605 concrete positions with steel cupolas. It has anti-tank guns, Tobruk machine gun emplacements, and concrete shelters all over. It's got barbed wire and a huge minefield. And they have to get through that huge minefield to get to the inner barbed wire. And they are under enemy fire. The enemy is also mostly underground. Taking Morris without a shot fired may also have helped convince the attackers this would be an easy one too. It's not. They should have some heavy backup. Six B-17s are supposed to drop a couple hundred fifty kilo bombs on Hillman, but heavy clouds spoils that. And the forward operating base officer, FOB, and his entire crew were killed in their LCA before landing, so they do not have access to the distant firepower of the cruiser Dragon and the destroyer Kelvin. They don't even have flail tanks to take out the minefield. This will take time. I've mentioned the traffic on the beaches several times before, but I'll repeat it yet again, summarized rather neatly in a long quote from Peter Caddick Adams' Sand and Steel. The narrowness of the beach, the delay imposed by cod, clearing sufficient lanes through the beach obstacles, and the tiny real estate on which to park a growing number of vehicles then combined to great congestion of staggering proportions. Some vehicles, including those of the engineers and the anti-aircraft units, had to stay close to the sand, while Sherman tanks, self-propelled guns, artillery tractors towing their weapons, and Bren gun carriers all queued up to exit the beach and deploy to where they were needed. Although the 185th Brigade Group began landing at 10 a.m., the strong onshore wind pushed the incoming tide further up the beach than expected. At high tide, the depth of usable beach available was down to just 10 yards, 30 feet, 9 meters. The Staffordshire Yeomanry, arriving alongside the 105 mm priests of the 7th Field Regiment at 10.30 hours, recorded a terrible traffic jam on the beach where no organization appeared to be operating and no marked exits were to be seen. The majority of our tanks remained stationary for one hour, and even after leaving the beach, vehicles remained head to tail for long periods on the only available routes. This was also the tragic consequence of landing with a single brigade at a time. The 9th Brigade, 3rd Division's Reserve Brigade, did begin landing a couple hours ago actually, but the bulk of them only start landing as this hour comes to its end. This is when Brigade Commander Jim Cunningham lands too. It has taken until now for a German command to really understand what is going on. But finally, this hour, OB West sends a somewhat correct report to OKW in Berlin. It reads, Oberbefehlshaber West to Chef Wehrmachtsführungsstabes Generaloberst Jodl, OKW, secret. Second assessment of the situation by OB West, tactical time, 12 a.m. After parachute landings behind Haka L-711, Infantry Division cleared forces, about one battalion destroyed about 50 prisoners. So far, no attack on 711. Infantry Division attack front looms from Orne Estuary to Barfleur. Local successes of the enemy at Orne Estuary and various beaches and coastal defenses. 716th and 352nd Infantry Divisions, partly by tank action, achieved. Landing still in progress at Mouth of Vier and at saint vast la hougue Attack of a thoroughly serious nature, which is also evident from the deployment of three airborne divisions and several parachute battalions. In the further course of the battle, encroachment on the north coast of Brittany not excluded. Destroying the strong airborne forces in the Carentan saint mary glise area is the main task. In any case, it seems advisable to advance the Ocavia Reserve Panzalea Division to the area around and south of Flair, since it is possible to intervene from there in all directions. Directions. Chef de Generalstabs OB West, gesetzlich Blumentritt General der Infanterie. You know, it's interesting that dealing with the U.S. Airborne is the main task and all that. You really see two things on each side in development now. For the Allies, a lot of the top brass, the main commanders, have come or are coming ashore, which means there's a general feeling of more security. But the traffic snarls could still sabotage the whole operation. For the Germans, the top brass is finally understanding what is going on. But that is thwarted by faulty preparations and lack of fighting power. It's things like that that can decide a war, and perhaps they will. But perhaps more importantly right now, whose armor is going to reach the men at the 
the bridges first, Allied or German? Perhaps we'll see when we return for hour 13 of D-Day. <laughs>